So our goal is to find the arc length of y equals the square root of nine minus x squared as x ranges from zero to three. So let's see what that looks like. One, two, three, one, two, three. And this is a quarter circle. You may recognize that fact. And we know the area of a, an entire circle is pi r squared. And we know the circumference of an entire circle is two pi r. Those are facts from geometry that we should have handy. Now, which one is relevant here for arc length? Arc length? That would be the circumference portion. But I don't have an entire circle. I have a quarter of the circle. So the circumference of the quarter circle would be one fourth of two pi r. And you can see in this case, <clears throat> what is the r that we're dealing with? The r that we have is three. So the circumference of that quarter circle, which is our arc length, right, is one fourth times two pi times three, which is what, six pi over four or three pi over two. So <clears throat> we're able to do that, how? We're able to do that just by appealing to geometry. Now, how can we do this in the world of calculus? That's the next question I wanna ask. So we need to visualize what arc length represents. So we have some kind of a function. This is a function, maybe y equals f of x. And we're gonna subdivide it into many little pieces. And then gradually we're gonna increase the number of pieces that we have so that we're going to have a sum of an infinite number of pieces and we're gonna use an integral to get there. But again, what, what do we know? What, what are our concepts here that we're dealing with? Well, the Pythagorean theorem is the key idea, right? That uh, if I have a situation like this, so let's, let's visualize one small part of this. Let's say it's from here to here. Approximately, this part we'll call change in X and this part we'll call change in Y and this arc length we will call change in S. We tend to use letter S for arc length. So that's just this little piece here, for example, blown up. And we know from Pythagoras that the change in S squared is the change in X squared plus the change in Y squared. And that enables me to go ahead and say something then about the arc length, because taking the square root of both sides, then the change in S is the square root of change in X squared plus change in Y squared. But that's only for that one little piece. I have all of these pieces. I have this piece plus this piece plus this piece plus this piece. So the total, uh, the total arc length or the sum of N pieces will be what? Sum of n segments for adding up these n segments together. Each one of these is the square root of change in x squared plus change in y squared. So we wind up getting the sum of the square root of change in x squared plus change in y squared. Okay. Well, then what? Then where do we go from here? Well, what we can do is we can do a little bit of algebra. We can do some algebra to help ourselves understand this. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide in essence by change in X here. So if I divide by change in X to keep it balanced, I've got to multiply by change in X here. And just for the sake of discussion, the way I have this drawn out, change in X is always going to be perceived as positive. So if that's the case, where does that lead us? We're thinking of change in X as positive. And we'll say the sum of N segments is what is the sum of 
the square root of change in x squared plus change in y squared over, I'm gonna rewrite the change in x as the square root of the change in x squared. And leave this one as the change in x. Hopefully you can follow that. And now I'm going to recognize that this sum of n segments make a big fraction here. What do we have? Change in x squared over change in x squared. Notice square root of the top over the square root of the bottom plus change in y squared over change in x squared. change in x. And we're getting close to developing the geometry or developing the rule that we need. So what do we do now? That's the sum of n segments. Now I want an infinite number of segments. So I want n to go to infinity, which of course means that the change in x goes to zero. So if that happens, then what do we get for our length? What are we gonna say? The arc length, will be what will be some kind of an integral from the starting point to the ending point, fine, from A to B. And again, X is our value that we're changing. <clears throat> Square root of what? Change in X squared over change in X squared is just one plus change in Y squared over change in X squared, I can write as what? I can write as change in y over change in x squared, but recognize we're shrinking all these things to zero. So as I shrink delta x to zero, change in y over change in x becomes dy dx, or the derivative of y with respect to x. And then that's going to be a squared. And then this delta x, as I'm shrinking delta x to zero, this becomes dx. Just to make sure you're clear, that point I had change in y squared over change in x squared, which is the same as change in y over change in x squared, and then shrink delta x to zero. What does that become? That becomes dy over dx squared. And what that does is that gives us a formula. So we built it from the geometry, from the Pythagorean theorem to say arc length, and the letter that we typically use for arc length is s. S is the integral as X goes from zero, X goes from A to B, whatever my starting point is. X goes from A to B of what? Of the square root of one plus dy dx squared dx. Or if you like, if Y is a function of X, another way we could write this, if Y is a function of X. You will occasionally see the formula written this way, that S is the integral as X goes from A to B of the square root of what one plus, well, if Y is a function of X dy dx is just F prime of X. So this is the formula we wanna to use to get us where we're going. Now, remember, where were we at? We were trying to find the arc length of y equals root nine minus x squared using a calculus strategy. So y is root nine minus x squared. From there, we certainly can find out what dy dx is. What does x range from in this picture? X starts at zero and it ends at three in terms of generating this curve. So that's what we're working off of. And let's get there. So. Our formula again is S equals integral from A to B. I like the dy dx version of this uh, frankly better, which is the square root of one plus dy dx squared dx. I'm just gonna warn you right now, these integrals are usually really nasty. They're usually really nasty. I'm gonna to try to pick some that are relatively workable for us. 
the value that we want is we want y equals the square root of nine minus x squared as x goes from zero to three. So in terms of this, now we have s is the integral from a to b, x ranges from zero to three. We have that as our starting point. And then we have the square root of one plus, I need to figure out what dy dx squared is and then we'll hook a dx on at the end. So what is dy dx? What will that be? Let's take a derivative using the chain rule, y equals nine minus x squared to the one half power. What is dy dx? It's one half nine minus x squared to the negative one half times the derivative of the inside times negative two x. So what does that give me? One half times negative two x is negative x. Multiplied by what? Multiplied by nine minus x squared to the negative one half, which moves nine minus x squared to the bottom to the one half. Again, what does dy dx mean? dy dx means negative x over the square root of nine minus x squared. And then I need dy dx squared. So what is dy dx squared? Square the top term, negative x times negative x is x squared. Square the bottom term, root nine minus x squared, root nine minus x squared, nine minus x squared. So that's the dy dx squared. That's what we're gonna replace here. x squared over nine minus x squared with a dx at the end. And now it just comes down to doing an integral. And like I said, oftentimes these integrals are really, really challenging. This one is in its own way. Getting a common denominator, one is nine minus x squared over nine minus x squared plus x squared over nine minus x squared dx. Next line. S is the integral. Nine minus x squared plus x squared just gives me a nine upstairs. Common denominator, nine minus x squared. Root nine upstairs, of course, is just three. So we get S is the integral as x goes from zero to three of three over the square root. of nine minus x squared dx. Okay, so we have a challenging integral for us to work off of, and that is gonna require me to play with what? To play with trigonometric substitution. So let's go there next. So our arc length for this quarter circle, we're going to say S is the integral as x goes from zero to three. three over the square root of nine minus x squared. So let's set up our triangle using trig substitution and see what we get. So what's reasonable here, draw our triangle, a squared plus b squared is c squared. I'm gonna put theta here. I am going to put, <clears throat> I need a root nine minus x squared. So I will put root, root nine minus x squared in this slot. When I square that, I get nine minus x squared. So I'm gonna need to have an x here. Notice, square this one, nine minus x squared plus x squared would be nine. So a squared plus b squared is c squared. This last slide would be three. Again, if you're not clear on that idea, a squared plus B squared is C squared. One of these guys is root nine minus X squared. So A squared plus root nine minus X squared squared is C squared. A squared plus C 
plus nine minus x squared is c squared. To make this simple, let a squared equal x squared plus nine minus x squared is c squared. So nine is c squared. So c is three, a squared is x squared. So a is x or absolute value of x. We'll just assume everything is positive and say a is x. That's how I build that triangle. <clears throat> so that's the first part of this process. Now I've got to go ahead and evaluate that integral. So what am I going to do? You see what our question is here. Let's make sense of it. So we've got to build this. Simplest ratio here, x over three, that's sine of theta. So sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. Sine of theta is x over three. Multiplying both sides by three, three sine theta equals x. Taking the derivative with respect to x of both sides, the derivative with respect to x of three sine theta is the derivative with respect to x of x. The derivative with respect to x of three sine theta is three cos theta d theta dx. The derivative with respect to x of x is just one. I need to sub out dx, so multiply essentially both sides by dx. Three cos theta d theta equals dx, and that makes me pretty happy. So I have dx, I need to get root nine minus x squared. How do I get that? That will be with cosine. Looking at this picture here, right? Cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. I think I have enough room, I can squeeze it here. Cos of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse root nine minus x squared over three. So three cos theta equals root nine minus x squared. So I will sub out this, I will sub out this. I'll worry about my endpoints at the end. And let's go ahead and make our substitution and see what we get. So where are we at currently? So we have the integral as x goes from zero to three of three over square root of nine minus x squared dx. We'll worry about the endpoints later. I'm gonna ignore them for now. Three, root nine minus x squared. Root nine minus x squared here tells me that's equal to three cos theta. What is dx? dx is three cos theta d theta. So I have a lot of threes running around here. So three times three upstairs, I have a nine upstairs and a three downstairs. So what is that going to give me? Nine over three is just three. The cos theta is divide out, right? Cos theta, cos theta divides out. So I just get three d theta. Well, the antiderivative of one, right? There's really a one there, one d theta. Tell, tell me a function whose derivative is one. The answer is theta. Three theta plus c, but it's not really a plus c. Remember, we have to uh, evaluate it at the endpoints once we're finished. What was theta from some endpoints? What was theta? Well, let's look. What did we say before? What did we say before? I guess this is the key element right here. Sine of theta is x over three. So if that's the case, if sine of theta is x over three, theta is the inverse sine of x over three. So three times sine of theta is x over three, theta is the inverse or arc sine of x over three. Now we can go back and plug in those endpoints. X is ranging from zero to three. So knowing that X ranges from zero to three. What's that gonna give me? Three times arc sine of three over three minus three times arc sine of zero over three, which is three uh, arc sine or inverse sine of one minus three times the inverse sine of zero. Now, what do we know? 
we know sine of pi over two equals one. So the inverse sine of one is pi over two. So this first piece, we get three times the sine of pi over two, excuse me, three, three times pi over two. Inverse sine of one is pi over two. Minus, what else do we know? Inverse sine of zero, we know sine of zero is zero. So inverse sine of zero is zero. So three pi over two minus three times zero. And what is my answer? My answer after all of that is three pi over two. But remember our very first page. So we just developed something with calculus that we were able to do immediately with geometry. So just reflecting back on our first page of this discussion, quarter circle, the circumference of the quarter circle is one quarter of the usual formula for circumference, one quarter of two pi r. r is three, so one quarter of two pi times three, six pi over four or three pi over two. So my answer with calculus agrees with the answer that I did using standard geometric principles.